announcement. We are starting a couple minutes late, but that is in the spirit of the TCG conference. Um, and we're keeping the traditions. What? It's going into the computer? Yeah. It's reverbing or something. Um, because we're so good at technology and that's why you're here to learn from us, we're having those kind of problems just to show you that, you know, we don't know what we're doing. Um, but we are actually trying to find a sound cable because we have one of our panelists that's being yeah. Skyped in, which is very cool and it's part of kind of how we did this work. Um, learning as we go, but we need a sound cable so that he can be heard. Okay. Otherwise, we'll be hearing him, he's great, but <laughs> you won't know what he's saying. So if you'll just bear with us a couple of minutes and we'll get started as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi everybody, I'm Chantal Rodriguez. I am the programming director for the Los Angeles Theater Center, and I'm also an adjunct professor of theater at Loyola Marymount University, and I'm on the steering committee of the Latino Latina Theater Commons. And Tlaloc, do you want to introduce yourself, and we'll try to, even though you're not loud enough, we'll repeat what you say. And that's, of course, when they decided no more pictures uh, because they didn't, they, the government didn't want that kind of anti-government activity to be fomented. I, that's a really brief encapsulation of what that was. Um, the other side of it is, of course, el movimiento, the first part of it, which is the legacy, uh, in particular, of the Chicano Latino movement of the 1960s wrapped around the struggles for the United Farm Workers, uh, trying to form their union, the, and, but more than that, the, the, the fight, the struggle for visibility and for appreciation, for acknowledgement of this large community that had, well, if you talk historically, the border had crossed them, uh, not the other way around, and they were being viewed as the infiltrators, and it was quite the opposite. And so it was about building the visibility and appreciation for this cultural history, legacy, and strength, uh, both an empowerment for the community itself and a statement to the community at large. So in, in that spirit, in that honor of the heritage, this title, El Movimiento, will be digitized because now what we're talking about is raising the visibility of our community and our work, empowering ourselves, expressing ourselves to the greater community, in essence, through these new tools that are available to us, which would not have been available five years ago even as, as shortly as, as, as recently as that. Um, but just a couple of words before we continue on. One of the things that's really critical to remember in all cases is that this, this, even with all the tools, this is ultimately a human endeavor. This doesn't happen without human beings um, taking, taking on this, this challenge and making it all occur. And what we're going to talk about is how the human beings use these tools to raise our voices. Feels like we're much. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh no. Uh, I want to thank TCG uh, in particular because part of where this emerged from, this movimiento, was in large part, we talked about this a bit yesterday in our intergenerational leaders of color meeting, where so many of us used to gather at previous TCG meetings under the tree, or over by the stairwell, or whenever we could, those lunchtime meetings, those famous lunchtime meetings, and we gathered around our communities, our identified communities, to share, to meet each other, to share our stories, and this was, this was a, a, national, a national gathering of artists who basically probably only got to see ourselves here at TCG at best. Um, and we're gonna talk a bit more about other events that were happening, but this was part of the strengthening of what we, we think of as a regional representation. Because a couple of years ago, um, we started a project through the technology of Conference 2.0, uh, 
I'm going to be brief. It's no, okay. no, 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 okay. I'm not going to be brief. Just, All right, okay. adjusting. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. We're, we're so in tune. Um, Conference 2.0, which is a tool that we use now quite frequently, but it allowed us to create a group that was called Latinos in Theater that found representation and meeting, in particular in the LA area. Uh, we had meetings in Arizona. We had meetings in Miami. We had meetings in Seattle and meetings in Portland at various center theaters. And the one in LA really took hold and is, and is now basically formed the foundation of what we can call a host committee to a, a project that has emerged out of the Latina Latino Theater Commons. Um, but many thanks to TCG for providing at least a, a place for us to gather and the technology for us to continue that conversation um, that then has leapt forward here. So I think that's all I need to say. I'm gonna turn it over to Chantal. Great, so welcome everybody. Um, I am going to give a very brief history of the Chicano Latino theater movement, just so that we can sort of see the continuity between these major waves in, in the Chicano Latino theater history and how this is really a subsequent wave um, that has been informed um, and inspired by all those who have come before us. Um, so a lot of people think that Chicano Latino theater is a new development, and it is not. Um, since the mid-19th century, truly, in the United States, there has been coast-to-coast -coast, um, influence and performance in theater by Latinos and Chicanos. Uh, at the time, they probably weren't called Chicanos yet, but um, there were touring circuits that existed from New York across the, the country to Los Angeles. They were doing primarily sort of Spanish melodrama, zarzuelas, um, from the 1920s to the 1950s, we started to see more sort of um, Mexican carpa tent shows, um, variedades or variety shows sort of during the vaudeville <coughs> era. Um, and so there was a really rich and thriving um, theater and performance culture amongst the Latinos, uh, Mexicanos across the country. Um, it's really in the 1960s, I think, that most people identify the specific Chicano Latino theater movement. Um, understandably so, the catalyst of the civil rights movement truly really launched um, the, the African American sort of renaissance of, of arts, um, Native American, Asian American, Latino theater and performance um, really all sort of started to spark in reaction and in response to the civil rights movement. Um, when we talk about waves, I see particularly uh, sort of waves along the west coast and waves along the east coast are so very broad um, sort of bi-coastal movements, but really it was happening across the United States. But in the West Coast, we primarily saw a lot of um, teatros, so small, individual, um, uh, little collective sort of that began to pop up, really with El Teatro Capesino being um, the first, right? When Luis Valdez comes to uh, Cesar Chavez and says, I want to make a theater of, by, and for farm workers. Um, and it really started a grassroots, you know, on the back of flatbed trucks and mobilizing out of a sense of urgency to bring um, the farm workers out of the field and to join the picket line. So there was this real sense of political urgency. Um, and then it really grew over the course of several years, hundreds of these teatros, these small theater collectives popped up all across um, the Southwest. And there were hundreds of them, to the point that in 1971, an umbrella organization was created called TENAS, El Teatro Nacional de Aslan. Um, and they became sort of this umbrella organization that then started to create uh, national festivals that would meet annually to see all of this work together. Um, similarly, on the East Coast, things were happening as well. Um, it was primarily Puerto Rican, New Yorican, and Cuban American theater companies that were being developed at the same time. Um, a lot of street theater, agitprop theater, and really theater that dealt with the cultural reaffirmation um, in response to the discrimination and prejudice that was being felt in the 60s and 70s, you know, even through today. Um, so we do have a shared history amongst Latinos of using theater and performance um, as a way to reaffirm our culture, but also as a tool against oppression. Um, so this, you know, happened throughout the 60s, uh, 70s, 80s, um, in the 80s and 90s was really the height of the multiculturalism movement in theater. Um, and I just want to talk about two very significant moments um, that have launched um, the careers and really sort of launched our contemporary theater movement, the Hispanic Playwrights Project at South Coast Repertory and the Latino Theater Initiative. Um, one of the co-directors is here with us, Luis Alfaro, uh, very influential and in developing so many of our voices 
um, in, in the American theater, truly. Um, and we see it as sort of the subsect of Latino theater, but truly these voices have been um, powerhouses in the American theater. Um, so we are coming from this large wave of artists um, who have worked collectively. And when we lost these two uh, developmental um, labs, really, it really left a void in, in the American theater. That's where I pick yeah. up. Yeah, that's where I come in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this wave, we're talking about El Movimiento. So we're looking, you know, with Chantal, way back to where it started, this big movement, right? And then we take that takes us all the way up to HPP and LTI, Hispanic Players Project and Latino Theater Initiative, right? Those went and they carried the ball forward, right? And then they collapsed. Uh, the institutions let them go. And then essentially what happened is we kind of all hung out in the regions. You know, I think that the Latino Latina theater movement at that point kind of became much more regional because we lost what was, you know, I think what was for the theater is a way to kind of get other artistic directors and folks interested in Latino work. But for us, it was our, our the, those, those um, festivals were our nucleus. Um, they were where we convened Latino and Latina theater makers um, around the country. So when we lost that nucleus in that point, we kind of went uh, regional. So, um, cut, uh, cut to, um, is this where I come in? Well, this would be this is where Tlaloc comes in. Yeah. yeah. Cut to Tlaloc writes a, a blog post about something that happens in Washington D.C. Can we skip? Yeah. Uh, make it maximize yeah. Maximize uh, Tlaloc. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we're we're going to maximize you. Wait, just a sec. Hello. Oh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. Yes. Right. Can you hear? Okay. Um, hi. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the blog post about you know, the Shakespeare Theater in the fall of 2011. The Shakespeare Theater in Washington, D.C. had a production of Much Ado About Nothing that was set on a free However, for the first few weeks of the run, the characters were ordinary, ordinarily 
inspires Karen Zacarias to uh, ask uh, the arena stage to bring eight uh, Latino and Latina theater makers to uh, DC to discuss the state of the field. Um, that just happened by email. There's no big technological hoo-ha going on there. But in that meeting of eight, uh, we decide, one, to form the Latino Theater Commons, two, that we want to do uh, four things. We want to launch a, a website, technology. Uh, we want to launch a website called Cafe Onda. Uh, we want to create a, uh, a convening, we want to kind of broaden our, our, uh, our meeting to a hundred or so uh, Latino and Latina theater makers from around the com uh, country at a national convening. We want to create uh, an encuentro of 10 world premiere productions by 10 Latino companies uh, in Los Angeles. And we want to, um, we want to create the Carnaval of, uh, at that time we called it New Fest a, fest a festival of new Latino work. Um, and we decide to do it at DePaul. We just decide all these things. Yeah, we just say we're gonna do all this stuff. Um, and mainly to one, pick up where HPP had left off. We wanted to find a way, really in the end, to find a way to um, uh, uh, convene again, to find a way that we could serve as a nucleus that had been lost, yeah? To take the baton and move it forward. And this is, a, in a second, gonna be what technology does. But we, you know, we, we structure ideas around the idea of um, uh, restructuring, uh, structure ideas around restructuring. We decide to restructure the American narrative. And what we mean by that is two things. Restructure the way we're seeing. Uh, is that right? Is restructure the right word? Uh, Update okay. the American narrative. Thank you, Jamie. Update the American narrative. One, uh, about how we are, what is Latinidad and how are we perceived? And um, to kind of help folks who are bewildered, confused, misguided, uh, just don't know, understand Latinidad uh, more deeply, to advocate for ourselves in the field, but also um, this idea, and it was actually David Dower, but it was a great idea, which was because we are already a bi, tri, and polycultural, uh, because Latinos are already bi, tri, or um, often polycultural people, and um, it affects our, uh, uh, and you see it in our dramaturgy, you see it in the plays themselves, that we, we, we seek narratives, or we seek new narratives and new structures that um, articulate that polycultural experience with the nation moving to 51% in however many years, that we could, that people need us, that this country needs us right now, that this country needs the Latino community to update the American narrative because of our already innate polyculturalism and the way that it articulates itself in our dramaturgy. So we move forward with this idea. We see all this great stuff, we all leave, and we think, okay, great, that was great, that was awesome. Yeah, um, I wonder what will happen, yeah? The next thing that happens is we decide, oh, you know, uh, Polly says, uh, apply for this grant. So, well, we apply for this grant. Now, this is where technology starts to come in. Because um, Polly and Jamie start saying, apply for this grant. Talak says he's going to write it, and he does write it. He hands it off to Karen Zacarias and myself via email. Karen Zacarias and myself edit. We send it back to Jamie and Polly at HowlRound, uh, and they submit it. And then we get this grant, which is to, for, which is to uh, make the convenient, to create the convenient. So we get this grant from Doris Duke, and now we have to get moving. Now suddenly, we have a thing to do, and we have to get moving, and we're all, all over the country. How are we gonna do it? In steps, El Movimiento will be digitized. Technology, go ahead, Jane. Great. Yeah, so the meeting of eight at Arena Stage came at a really serendipitous time. We had um, just recently found a cow round, and it was originally a project of Arena Stage, but myself and colleagues were moving up to Emerson College in Boston and um, kind of you know, decided to move our, our work there. And so we were at a particularly interesting point of movement and transition when the first meeting happened. 
Um, so really, we had been working in a certain frame, where we had started to develop this frame of the kind of work that we wanted to do. So HowlRound um, has essentially, thank you so much, has essentially provided infrastructure for the Latino Theater Commons since its inception. And for those of you who don't know HowlRound, we essentially build online platforms that promote knowledge sharing and aggregation. Um, we're trying to build the knowledge commons for the theater, which basically means we're trying to pool resources together in the hopes that new collaborations will come, that we're all gonna be better off together than we would be separate. Right? So our approach, the frame and everything that we do is we use a commons based approach, which basically means that we want to allow as few barriers to access as possible. We want to be radically transparent. We want to basically try to encourage anyone and everyone to bring what they can, when they can, to the table. So this was essentially the model in which the Latina, Latino Theater Commons started working. So a commons, um, we, we throw the terminology around a lot, but it's essentially, it's a form of wealth that we inherit or create together that no one owns and that is shared in order to benefit a community. Um, so normally what we think of when we hear the word commons, um, it's, it's, it comes mostly from, you know, like the, the um, eco movements, right? Like no one owns the ocean. No one owns the air. Like, there's a certain amount of common benefit that we all have, and we all need to be stewards of everything that, that we do, uh, do, you know, on the planet. So the strategy that we use um, is essentially, in all of our platforms, is that it's, it's peer production. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. And so that means that anyone can contribute. It's essentially open sourcing, right? And that anyone can use what's out there, remix it, do whatever they want with it, in the sense that, essentially, we're all gonna be better off if we have access to these pooled resources. So this is the whole context in which the Latino, Latino Theater Commons came into being. And it was sort of just the serendipitous marriage of ideas that were both, you know, in our world at that point, like fairly heady and philosophical, but then the meeting at Arena really sort of brought it to bear in this very real world context of, okay, how do we operationalize these ideas? So the key ideas behind both the, the knowledge commons that HowlRound is, is trying to build and by extension, the, the Latino Latino theater commons is that the community sets the agenda. The community, not one person, not a kingmaker, not a curator, the community. Um, every participant is a stakeholder. Everyone co-owns, co-creates, co-develops what it is that we're trying to do. Um, HowlRound's role in this is really one of being a steward or an infrastructure designer. So we already have these tools that we've been working on. They're open to anyone, and we're just going to make sure that they get used to the best of their ability, if it's useful to that particular group of people. Um, and last but not least, really the point of all of these is that we're trying to unlock abundance we're trying to say there is enough for everyone. We're trying to promote a non-scarcity mindset of competition and you know, feeling like we all have to go after the same thing to the detriment of other people, right? And we're trying to sort of say there is enough. Let's all raise, raise together, right? So the key benefits of this. Um, it's revelatory. There's so many people out there doing amazing things that thank, thanks to technology, we can now find out about. Um, so many people who, people, companies, just across the country, across the world, it's a really efficient use of resources. If you have one sort of common infrastructure that can, that can exist for a, many, many people, you stop replicating the kind of things where, oh, every single theater needs to have, say, a live streaming channel, every single theater needs a blog, every single theater needs, all of these things that take resources ultimately out of the hands of artists and put it into the sort of traditional overhead number, right? It's, it's trying to say, no, we can create a common infrastructure that we can all benefit from. It galvanizes the community because everyone's empowered, they have a voice, they can contribute what they want to contribute, when they want to contribute, and very importantly, it creates an accessible archive of current practice. So everything on HowlRound, whether it's written content, live stream video, um, you know, the new play map, data, everything, lives there, right? Thanks to the internet, it's all now accessible, you can search for it, and it, you know, and it's this growing body of work and documentation. Okay, let's go on. Yeah, we'd like to hear from Tlaloc now. 
Okay. We want to open up to anybody. Is this a place where oh, we want to open up to questions? Oh, we can, absolutely. Questions? If anybody has any questions at this point, because we don't want to save them all to the end. Yeah, and actually we want to make that available to you at any point in this conversation, that it really become a conversation and not just us talking at you. Um, if there's any point where you would want to stop for a little clarification or just, you know, like, whatever, please just stop us. We're cool. And one thing I wanted to course. say that I forgot to say that was on my little list is that, so once we get to the place where we get the grant, uh, we have to then form a steering committee. And this is really when technology and the tools that Jamie's going to talk about in a second come into play. Because we have to form a steering committee of 50 people, so we go from 8 to 50. And at that point, we start really using certain tools online beyond emails and phone calls begin to form the steering committee and then from the steering committee to move forward to create the convening. But I want to say, and it, it, it can't uh, bear, it's, not, it's never under, it's, it can't bear, it can't not bear repeating, um, that at this point, technology, it helps form, helps make the Latino Latina Theater Commons happen. At this point, um, the baton, which has been actually dormant for since 2002, I think, right? 2002, 2003, I think it was? The HPP and LTI died, right? Um, it's been kind of dormant. It's technology that allows us to pick up the baton and move forward and create a community again, a national community again, which we hadn't been able to do. Even six years ago, some of the technology did not exist. Great, so speaking of technology, we'd like to invite Lala to talk a little bit about one of the first manifestations. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this, so Jamie will address this a bit more. There were sort of internal tools that were used among the sort of the planning team of the steering committee, and then external to tools that allowed us to communicate with the whole field and keep us all informed and participating. And one of the primary external tools was the creation of this web page called Cafe Onda. And so I'll turn it over to Tlaloc to discuss, share a little bit about that, its philosophy, et cetera. See, it's you, Tlaloc. Can you hear me?
disseminate and illuminate the questions of Latinidad, including what is Latinidad, what does it mean? Is there an aesthetic that we can define and share that isn't tied to or defined by a dominant culture's dramaturgy? How can we promote and share work with the next generation of Latina Latino theaters, uh, artists, and others? So that's, that's this element that started opening that kind of dialogue and that level of dialogue uh, around the country among theater makers. So I think we move now to uh, internal and external tools uh, with Jamie. Any questions so far? Any questions? So, you know, essentially Cafe Onda is, is linked to HowlRound. So it's a part of what, we're, what we currently call, you know, essays, practice, and opinion. So it's journal pieces, blogs, um, and we'll eventually have new group reviews, but essentially it's an external tool to communicate not only to the Latino Latino theater community, but to the American theater at large using, you know, the advantage of having a wide audience that already frequents this particular site. So let's move to Okay, so what are the actual tools that we started using? So internally, um, you know, as Lisa mentioned, we formed this steering committee to plan the first convening, and it was, you know, roughly 30 to 50 people, depending upon how you looked at it, all over the country. So how are we really effectively going to work together to pull off this major initiative? One of the first things that we picked up was obviously conference calling. So the great thing about this particular tool, freeconferencecalling.com, is A, it's just that, it's totally free. You can also record the conversations really easily and they turn into MP3s that you can then upload. So not only can you have just an archive of it if you wanna listen, but if people can't make the meeting, it's a really good way to keep people sort of in tune um, and, and able to you know, participate afterwards. Great. Other internal tools, Google Docs, many of you probably use them, and Dropbox, you know, but essentially creating an easy way so that wherever people are without having the same internal server or what have you, people can easily access document. Our biggest savior, I think, in this whole endeavor so far has been a project management tool called Basecamp. Okay. Um, there's many different versions of said tool, um, but it's something that we started using in 2010 or 2011, and, and, it's, and it came out in like 20, what, when did it start Basecamp? Right, 2008, right? 2008? Yeah, I don't know. As a tool? As, a, as, a, as an available tool, not very yeah. long ago. So essentially it's a project management software, and so what it does is it provides a sort of centralized place where you have a calendar that anyone can add to, you can put people in different groups, you can essentially send messages, you can upload files, and it's just a really great way to sort of keep one particular project, in our case, what has turned into many projects, all working together, via the internet, it has a great app, you can email in response to messages and it'll show up on the actual site. And the beautiful thing about it is that it actually, then you have a record of literally everything as it's happening. And so it's exactly. not, exactly, so it's not about, you know, going through your work email <laughs> or your personal Gmail to try to find that one thing from a gazillion years ago. Um, there's another shot of Facecamp. I wanted to mention one of the nice things that happens is that you can also provide these links to Google Docs. So, so there are documents, as you see, Boston Convening 2013. That's a Google Doc because it's a, and it's an Excel spreadsheet model that then allows you to have the contact list for the people that attended, the contact list for the people who participated externally in a, in a long distance way. Um, what the agenda was for that meeting and who handled what element of that. So that's also, and I found incredibly useful that it worked with other platforms really quite seamlessly. And then, as we said, is an archive. So if you go to files which we're not going to go to, you'll see the original Doris Duke document. You'll see all the documents that we've created in this process are in Basecamp, which means at any moment, any of us who need, for example, to know the, um, to find language, you know, talking points, um, needs to write another grant, wants to remember what we said last time, it's all there and all our conversations are there, meeting, um, notes. meeting notes, it's all there. So it's, this is an incredible tool. This, this tool, uh -huh. I, I've never seen anything like it. Um, but in this, I, I would say this tool of all the tools is what made yeah. everything that we've done thus far possible. Yeah, the other, it, it allows us to stay organized and in contact with it. So. The, no, it's fine. The other great thing about Basecamp is that you can create to-do lists. I'm a big list maker. <laughs> and um, if you are, say, a project manager or a producer, you can assign anyone who's on 
your Basecamp project a to-do with a deadline, and they'll get an, an automatic reminder email that basically says, you have this milestone coming up, like don't forget to do it. So if you're me, at various times, I would go in and make like massive to-do lists and just be able to ping everyone, right? Yeah. And it's so much easier than you know sending 20 emails saying, hey, did you remember that you were gonna do that? So it's really about efficiency, putting everything in one place, and it's very user-friendly. And it well. doesn't require a boss, right, or anybody. You know, again, it's common space, but it allows us from around the country, it allows Jamie to ping me and say, hey, remember that grant deadline? Do you know? So again, it's a way that we can network together across the nation to get work done. Yeah. Um, so now I'm going to just touch briefly on external tools, which we already touched a little bit on. But um, first of all, we have the, the Latino Theater Commons webpage, which currently lives on HowlRound. It's sort of the standard place that you can go to find out about past initiatives. It has links to everything that's sort of relevant. In the back. In the back. Um, and then the next one, so we have the Cafe Onda page, which essentially is the aggregation of all Cafe Onda content to date. It's also accessible via the archive on HowlRound. We're actually in the process of doing a web redesign this summer, and so there'll be a new sort of iteration come fall of both Cafe Onda with a more heightened presence as well as um, making HowlRound content easier to dig through. Um, Live streaming LTC <laughs> events. Look at the lovely Lisa Portes. <laughs> I believe that was at the Goodman. Um, and then, of course, we have an open Facebook group, which we very purposefully keep open so that anyone who wants to join can join. And we also do quarterly email updates, um, which is to an open list of anyone who wants to, to hop on board. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts and how some of these tools we use as we move forward in planning the, the convening, because as you remember, there were sort of four things that came out of that group of eight, and one of the big ones, because now we have a web presence, was the next, the, the next big gathering of ideally somewhere they had been about 100 theater makers from around the country. And so there were a variety of committees that had to be um, implemented that were formed out of the steering committee of 50, and those were fundraising, because the Doris Duke provided a certain amount, but there was more that needed to be done. Uh, programming, what were we gonna do over this convening that was going to take us about a long weekend? Uh, outreach, how were we gonna communicate all of these plans and invitations to the field at large? Uh, and then the, 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 we had a, an issue with facilitation of people who did not know how to work with these tools, and, uh, and then planning satellite sessions that happened in conjunction so that we were, even though there was a convening happening, the room was only 100 people, and we saw ourselves, we remember, just gonna jump to this as delegates in the field. How did we bring other people, pretty much like we're attempting to bring in Thalak into this conversation, how did we bring in others into the room at the same time through technology? So I'll turn it over to Lisa first, who's gonna talk about fundraising. I'm just gonna back up for a second. The, uh, the initial steering committee of 50, um, we did need to, there was, I, I wanna kind of, there was a skitter step. So the initial steering group of 50 met as many of them as possible in Boston actually to, to, oh, yes. to actually come together. Because the thing is, is this has to move, technology exists and we use it as tools, but it has to kind of create moments that we come together. You know, it can do only so much of the work and then it allows us to figure out how we come together. So um, 30 to 50 of the original steering committee that came together in Boston to then figure out what are we gonna do in this convening and out of those came these different, um, these different uh, co committees, subcommittees, right? But the process of getting the 50 and getting them to Boston, again, we were using Basecamp, we were using conference calling, we were using all those tools. So then out of that uh, convening of the 50, comes the subcommittee. So fundraising, I was on the fundraising committee, and you know we researched, we, uh, uh, about five of us researched different grants, all the different grants and all the ideas that came out of the group, the meeting of the 50, um, went up on Basecamp, the Doris Duke grant, the, uh, and who was doing what, so there was a to-do list. It was like, who was going after Doris Duke? Who was going after Goya? Who was going over Southwest Airlines? Who was going after what? With little boxes and little deadlines and little check marks and emails that would come. Yeah, um, and then when we would write a grant, we would put it up online and we'd be able to communicate with each other. And then I was in charge of, you know, pestering people. So there was that, and then there was phone calls, you know, um, and emails. Hey, did you follow up on blah, 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 and phone calls. But then we were using kind of all three tools to really, it takes, you know, you have to do a lot of nudging to fundraise. Um, but the deadlines and the to-do list really, I think, made what we, made, uh, allowed us to raise um, 
the however many, how many, 50? How much money did we raise? Around, around $50,000 in a very short period of time. I mean, between May and October, I think we raised $50,000. Um, and the fundraising committee was four people. Yeah. Um, so again, tools helped. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to talk about programming. Um, programming was a really interesting process that had, you know, there were a variety of things that we needed to touch base about. This was the first gathering of its size in, what was it, 20, 30 years, 28 years or something? Mm -hmm. it, it, the, the last gathering of, of even comparable size what had been uh, back in the 80s um, was a, a, an organization called Tenaz, which was an association of uh, Teatros Teatro Nacional de, Teatro Nacional de Aztlán. Uh, mostly Chicano identified theaters, but it extended as far as New York, so of course this was Latino identified theaters predominantly. And, um, and so this, this undertaking, it was, it, was, it was huge, and what did we want to gather at that point? Uh, and so part of the effort, there were, uh, again, we go back to the, the human element. A few of the members of the team, and uh, Kinan Valdez was uh, the, the chair of, this, of the programming committee, um, met in California in person to talk over some of the ideas around what did we want to happen over the three days of this gathering. And from that, uh, an, uh, an agenda was created that then got discussed among the program committee, which was a national committee, and we would go back and forth and we'd have the tele teleconferences, we would get in there, we would change the documents, but we'd all track changes, um, and really have conversations about what did, how do we want to spend this opening part? How do we want to do with the second day? What was the thing we were going to do? And, and, and those even transformed in the room a little bit when we finally met in Boston in November. Um, but it was, a, it was a process that we kept meeting uh, uh, monthly and then every two weeks, a little bit closer, um, until we refine it, refine it, refine it, refine it, refine it, to create our agenda for, um, for that, that long weekend. And one element of it was creating a book, uh, the, the, the program that had to be published in advance and had everybody that was attending biography and photograph and the agenda and the sponsors and all of that was done through these tools of, of sharing the document, okay, now it's a PDF, okay, but now we can go in and edit it and, and just this constant revision of people just engaged in getting it and getting to it by Friday and getting your notes in and, and talking about it and talking through it philosophically on the phone and then tangibly through text. What's the language we're gonna use? And it really helped us be very clear about what we were trying to articulate, what our goals were with this convening. Um, but then talk it through philosophically in a way that only the voice can. There are, can I interject real quick? So there's two things that I think I wanna highlight in terms of these tools. Most of them are free, totally free. I mean, if you need above a certain bandwidth, then you usually have to start paying some sort of monthly due. But like for instance, it, Olga, Olga was speaking to the agenda, all of the information we got from the participants, we got through Google Forms, which are totally underutilized, but they're amazing. You can make things required questions, so people have to give you that information when you ask for it. And it's really like the, you know, the only way to sort of try to manifest all of that information in one place. I'm going to switch it over to Tlala if we can reach it. Yes, no, let's connect with John. Okay, so first we don't have Tlala. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit about outreach and you folks, or do you want to talk about that, Jane? No, I was just thinking perhaps we should move to the national community. We should probably move, on. yeah, because these, I mean, these, we were basically, well, I mean, we okay. should talk about facilitation for the elders. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and we should talk about, plan, uh, yes, we should yeah. talk about that. Okay. Outreach work the same way. Right. Outreach uh, um, So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say sort of the, the technology aspect, what it also showed us was that not everyone has the same access to technology, first of all, and then also not the same experience or dexterity with technology, regardless of age, right? There was sort of a round, that was sort of an issue. Um, and so I was on the advisory committee at that point, and part of my role was then to help facilitate, just naturally have been facilitating for some people who couldn't handle that, or if I was in LA, I could meet with someone and put their information in for them. Um, similarly, 
um, you know, I work for an artistic director who's extremely busy, as most artistic directors are, and so it allowed some of us in your advisory committee to start to learn some of this time management to help facilitate those who wanted to participate. Um, and we sort of became, um, I was a stand-in essentially a lot of the times at a lot of these meetings. But as Jamie mentioned, this was an archive that then those leaders could go back and see what we had done. But I was able to be a voice for my organization. So it was also a lot of training that I think is really related to like succession leadership, looking like long-term, how these things can help, how you learn to juggle multiple projects. Um, and so that really gave me a sense of agency and a lot of the people on the advisory committee did that. So it was both sort of facilitating for those who were not sure how to use it. Yeah, technologically challenged, <laughs> yeah. but then also sort of having, feeling like we had a, a role and it was a great learning experience. And I just wanted to jump in because there's a generational question, right? They have still things for the elders and then yeah, also and transparency for the youngers. Right, right, yeah. we were talking about the, the kind of entry for the Before we get to the youngers, may I just make one small comment, which is one of the things that I appreciated about this effort is that it upheld a cultural um, respect that we have for those that came before us, for those carved the way who are still out there fighting, and it brought them into the conversation thanks to that facilitation. Great. But on the converse of that, the idea that what we were hearing in the intergenerational leaders of color, what we hear in a lot of these meetings is, is this gap, right? It's, it's, it's the young people saying, like, the young people, saying, how do I get involved? How do I be my mentor? How, how, how? And technology kind of became this, this leveler, right? Like all of a sudden, people like Chantel, people like myself, whatever, were, were given a lot of agency. And we were like, oh, cool. You know? <laughs> uh, and, and, it, and it gave us the opportunity to really start working with some leaders that we may not have been able to, to at least I can speak for myself, right? That I may not have been able to do in another, in another time without these tools, without this group of people, right? It, it, and bringing us together in Boston just leveled the play up, right. playing field even more. And I'd just like to say it also gave us a level of visibility, right? You you see Abigail's name in an email after like three weeks. They're like, oh, I know Abigail, but you know, and and it gave a sense of visibility. And we knew everybody's name. And then when we went into the in person, then it was putting a face to that name, and you felt like you knew these people after communicating for so long. Right? Mm -hmm. Great. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Satellite? Satellite? Sure, so one of the things, and I can speak, I haven't spoken because up until, I'm putting my timeline, I was not involved up until the So you got involved at the convening? I got involved at the convening. Well, right before, was, right? Yeah. Right before, our, uh, initially I came on uh, because, the, because the LTC decided that they shouldn't be the only people in the room, that we are symbolic delegates and that we need to involve other people. So they decided to have five satellite sites uh, on Saturday, Saturday morning, mm -hmm. Saturday morning session. And so we Skyped in uh, a satellite in, in New York, in DC, in Dallas, in Miami, in LA and in Chicago, and um, and this was symbolic, right? Because because we want to we want to we didn't talk a lot. People in Boston didn't talk a lot during that session. This was about opening the conversation up to people from all over the country, and um, and so so they had they contacted particularly us in Chicago, and they said, hey, you know, would you mind facilitating this? And this was before I was invited to the convening. It was kind of like the timeline was a little wonky, um, and so we facilitated it at um, the Goodman. They they some space, we had a couple of different facilitators, Isaac was one of them. That's and where everybody met Isaac. Yeah. <laughs> was I was in his space on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> That's so what it's true uh, though, but I just gotta say that. That's where everybody met Isaac, because yeah. his face was on that screen. He was a young person who knew, who was savvy with the technology and you know, could serve as the Chicago host. And I remember everybody getting around the kind of, you know, in the group going, who's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it provided, again, a level, right? A level playing, a level playing field. Um, and, and so that's what that's what we did, um, and I thought that was such an excellent idea because it was symbolic, right? It was this idea that we are being as open and as transparent as possible, which is one of the main, main, main tenets of the LTC. And that this is that we are a national community, and technology. I'm just going to say it over and over again because that's what teachers do. Technology facilitates a national community. And I just wanted to say a quick question. Yeah, I'll, and then really quickly was that it also honored the fact that there had been regional movements that were starting right. simultaneously to us, right? So it wasn't like the national group then created movements in the regions. The regions had developed these movements already. So That's in LA, in Chicago, there had already been this uh, mobilization. So it honored that fact too that we, we've all been working at the same time. And we've been able to reach out. the questions that were held in that Skype session, I'm sorry, were about what are you doing in your community to support your local artists, and and um, in what way can and how and then we had questions across. So it wasn't even just with Boston. It was questions from Dallas to Miami, from Chicago to LA about things that they were working on. It was rough, 
It was challenging. It wasn't perfect. Not everybody had the same setup, but we did get it done, and that was amazing. That's what we were saying. We, we, we should let Isaac so ask this Isaac question. So Isaac and then Maya. Um, just to, to interject a little bit from someone who was on the opposite end of this satellite viewing, um, what it provided for those of us who were in Chicago at the time was was um, an avenue which which I think I feel like is a consensus in several Latino theater communities is uh, uh, different, especially theaters of color have very specific things going on and devote a lot of time to them, and there are not many opportunities for them to come together in one space to say, okay, now what can we do for this city? And so the LTC having this thing was a great opportunity for Chicagoans to come in, and even for those of us like myself who had only been there for two months, to come and say, like, I want to join the party too, you know, and, um, and being a part of this, you know, was, was the, was, if, no, it definitely was the reason why I was able to become more involved. So this idea of access that has been reflected um, in this conversation and technology, had it not happened, had Twitter not existed, then, then those opportunities were in the presented themselves. Maya, you had a question. Um, I just wanted to clarify. So when you did the satellites in the five different cities, were you using Skype? Skype. Yeah. So, so basically, basically like this setup. But yeah. much better. But so it worked. It was a, <laughs> but it actually worked. It was a couple different things. One was we live streamed the whole convening. So that meant that anyone could watch from anywhere, period. We also had a Twitter hashtag, so anyone could contribute to the conversation whenever they wanted. But then we did designate this specific Saturday session as a as a satellite as a satellite check-in, but also to encourage people in their local communities to come together, have a watch party, talk about what they'd already seen from the from the previous day or two, and then be able to contribute. So we used yeah, we used Skype. Um, but we used group Skype. We pre teched all of the satellites. We didn't pre tech so, today, you guys. So it wasn't like we couldn't get in here. Like this, and and it was it was a cha yeah, it definitely was a challenge, but it but it worked. I mean, we really did see. We really did see. There was a hundred of us in the room. We really did see five different screens with five different communities of anywhere from five to a hundred people. It was incredible. <laughs> we heard Dallas. We heard Dallas. And we felt such the, and on the other side felt so much support from everyone there because it, you know, the, uh, because of all, they were only able to invite so many people to the convening, um, there may have been, and this was a definite opportunity for people to feel included. Mm -hmm. And that's commons and that's, you know, you know, I mean, that's everything that we believe in is inclusivity and transparency and access. <coughs> okay, so we're gonna move forward, keep moving forward. So now we're at the convening and as uh, Jamie and Lisa mentioned, we had these various things going on there. I'm just going to repeat the idea that it was about the people. One of the basic tenets is that we, we need to meet in person. There's nothing that replaces. It's, it's how and why we do theater, because we're in the room. You can, you can live stream it, and Skype it, whatever. We have five minutes. No, no, we have long minutes. No, we have to four minutes. We're OK. Four 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 minutes. Minutes. We're we're okay. So we have, um, we have 15 minutes. OK, uh, we're almost done. Anyhow, the point is, that some of the activities and things that happened in that room um, were on paper, were the creation of a timeline. If you could go back a couple of mm -hmm. slides, there's an image on our, right there. Oop, no, 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 there. That, those, that colorful little thing, that was a series of, 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 of walls, I guess, that people had put on little sticky papers um, events of note in their personal histories as artists or in the history of Latino theater. And it was a timeline that stretched from one wall, I mean across like, like half that. of this wall, yeah. right? It was, it was really long and it was done in person and it and was on people. Brought, people and people brought, brought elements. <laughs> there was an altar. We, were, we met right around Dia de Muertos. We had an altar that represented what we were bringing to the table. Things that had to happen in the room. And, it's, and it, so it doesn't replace that Aspect. But we tried to extend that as much as possible through these other tools out, to share that out as much as possible. Um, that's, I think that's, uh, the only other one, the thing I want to say is at the end of that gathering, we, we were given loteria cards. And at the back of the loteria cards, we were asked to please write our, our commitment, our interest in what we wanted. We had talked about a lot of different things that we wanted to do. Um, a lot of visions that we had for ourselves and for the field, uh, for our, each other, and, and what we were interested in.
interested in what we would commit to doing. And these were then put on the altar, and what was taken off the altar was what we had put on the altar and given to somebody else. So we were giving the gift that we put on the altar to give to somebody else as a gesture, but we left behind in the basket our commitment to this community and this effort to this community. And that's all in person. Which then became digitized. Which became digitized. Yeah. That's it. So that's, that's where we go. It's digitized. Digitized. So that's where we go to, right? And I just want to I just want to note the pattern. The pattern is people together, tech, 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 people together, tech, 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 tech. Right. People together, right here, we're all together. Do you know what I mean? But it's like those, and I, I think it's so important because I have always been like, technology, it will replace my flesh. No. Uh, and in fact, you know, we're, you know, we got all oogie boogie in there. You know what I mean? We had, we, we did yoga together, we put stuff up on a wall, we had an altar. <laughs> then we go back to super tech. So at this point, you know, we, we the meeting happens, it's fantastic. Um, uh, and it, succeed, it, it succeeds in doing what we wanted it to do, which is provide a locus let lots of people in, provide access, and get something going. We all felt very energized. So then it's how do you, again, take it forward? And movimiento, how do we take it forward? So we formed two committees on the final day. Um, well, one was a restructuring committee, because we, the, at that point, at the, day, at the final day of the committee, the, the steering committee of 50 dissolved. Yeah, at that point we dissolved as a steering committee. This is a de democratic process, we dissolve. Um, and also we realized that Jamie is going to leave us and we need to hire a new producer. Yeah, so we create the hiring committee. Um, and then we all leave, because we do this in about two hours, and then we all leave, so how do we do the rest of this? So we um, go back to our, to our tools. And at this point, Basecamp comes into kind of strong use uh, again, conference calling, Google Docs. Um, the hiring committee, and this is where we get to kind of what is online and what is offline. The hiring committee actually, because of the nature of the information, the sensitivity, was an offline. It was not going on on Basecamp. Yeah, that was mainly by phone calls and you know private phone calls. It was not being uploaded because you know there's candidates and there's information and there's a kind of a search process, right? Um, whereas the restructuring committee is all actually on base camp, um, and we are literally for to, to restructuring committee is to find the new steering committee, the steering committee 2.0. We're literally on the phone on a conference call, Every I think once a week, yeah. trying to figure out what the Latino theater, what form the Latino theater commons is going to take. Who's going to be involved? How do we decide? How do we decide we're a commons? You know, how do we how do we go about deciding who's going to be involved? What is the process by which um, steering the steering committee will come together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So we're meeting by conference call, and we're sharing documents, we're um, testing ideas, we're all kinds of things, and then we come up with the steering committee, which was launched in steering committee 2.0 was launched, soft launched uh, January end of January in January, and then the hire happened May. in April. So from October to January, weekly meetings. I'm telling you, on conference calls. We took calls. breaks during Christmas. We did. <laughs> <laughs> but we managed to restructure the committee, and then we managed to hire a new producer. And that is where we are currently. And I think it's important to say just quickly about the yes, new please. committee is that there was a lot of thought put into the idea of dissolving 1.0 because you know when we first got the grant money, no one thought beyond doing the. Convening. I mean, you know, I mean, realistically, no one was going there, and so there had to be a conscious choice after the convening of, do we want this work to continue? How do we want it to continue? And what is the process by which we restructure so that it's, you know, reflective of our whole approach? Yes, and so, I forgot two things. Go ahead. So 2.0 basically had um, a very, it, it currently has a very conscious split of some people who were on the first steering committee and wanted to continue the work. Some people who um, expressed specific interest at the convening on the last day, working on a national level. On their loteria cards. Exactly. Yeah. And then another subsect of people who had not been involved at the convening, had not you know, been, been previously involved with the LTC at all, but you know, had somehow sort of come into the world. So it was a very conscious you know, reconstituting and the widening of the circle, right? And because is, yeah. the second it becomes exclusive is the second we stop being a commons, right? And so it has to have that intentionality going into the basic design for it to be successful. And also I should mention Steering Committee 2.0 is a working committee. So we made a decision early on that the committee would be made up of people who were actually on other committees. So it was the Loteria cards became actually crucial to the process because if somebody said, I want to help with the LTC Carnaval, I want to help with the Maria, Maria Irene Fornes thing. I want to help with, um, I want to serve on the steering committee. Level. I it's want to help with the Encuentro. I want to help with the Cafe on the editorial board, right? Those are the, that we would put their names, you know, in various
various places, and those folks are the folks that became the steering committee. We made an early decision the steering committee would not would be a working committee, and it's made up of basically everybody who's doing the work on the current um, initiatives of the LTC. And we should turn it over to Chantal yeah. to talk about one of the biggest efforts that is now arising, which is the Encuentro and the selection committee. Great. So I just also want to say that what they're talking about also prevents burnout to a degree. That's been something that's come up in this conference and it is a major concern mm -hmm. for everyone at every stage of their career. So that's been really helpful knowing that when you're on a committee, it has an end point if, if you need it to. Um, so what the biggest thing we came out of uh, the convening with was that we wanted to create a national festival of Latino theater work. Hearkening back to the Tenaz days, we need to have a place where we can all meet together and see each other's work. And this grew out of the desire that Latino theater, while marginalized from mainstream theater, is actually extremely vibrant, and we have major productions that go up in cities all over the country, but they're only seen in those cities, and they don't necessarily tour, yet we have many theaters that have a home base, that have a space that could welcome other Latino theaters. So we said, what's the problem? We're not seeing each other's work. We don't know each other's work. Um, if we did, we could talk about aesthetics as a group in a certain way, and then we could build relationships and create a touring network that could give these works longevity and, and get them entry into the repertory of the American theater. So that was really the artistic impetus. So at the convening, people suggested, you know, on their Loteria cards they wanted to be involved. So we called those names together, then we did an ask, and some people then said no thanks or yes, and then we, we created our selection committee, which has 10 people on it. And uh, it's a variety. We wanted to make sure we had people from sort of the four directions, people all over the country in different capacities. Um, so they became a selection committee. We met primarily through Basecamp as well. Uh, we used Google Docs to have sort of a scoring sheet. The first thing we did was created the guidelines for the application for the Encuentro. We wanted the Encuentro not to be sort of a, where we're gonna hand pick people. We want people to apply um, so that we can consider their work. We had um, about 73 applications. Um, for what then has now become 14 slots. Um, and so we had this committee of 10 who read all those applications uh, individually. They submitted their thoughts into a scoring sheet and then we had an in-person live meeting in Los Angeles in April um, where everyone came together. So again, we can, we can all talk about things online, but there's a difference in talking in person and really abdicating for certain plays or, or talking about, I've seen that work and it felt, it moved me. And, so we could not replace the human experience from that. So we met, but the work was so intense and so much work that then it continued offline after the, the meeting. So the selection committee, we called it down to you know, a certain number of finalists, then we reached out to the finalists, we asked them to submit things, more work samples or photos, things like that. Um, and then we finally um, chose our final grouping some people were not able to come due to finances. There's been a lot of different elements that come into this, and I think it really opened up, the technological aspect opened up for across the country these selection committee members to understand sort of the nature of this festival um, and to still have a voice even from afar. Uh, and the other reason why we had to meet in person was so that they could see the space that we were talking about holding the festival in and know that play will fit into that realm, that proscenium theater is good for this play, that amphitheater should be here. So that's sort of what we did. And then that committee has since dissolved um, just because we've made the selections. They're on postcards that you have on your seats. Um, and so, so that committee is dissolved. But several of them then moved to what we now have, which is called the Tertulia Committee. And Tertulia sort of is a Spanish word for these like social literary events. And we have a committee that's planning additional programming around this month-long festival and host committee. So it's a committee world. Um, out there, but that's how we did it. And uh, similarly to the hiring committee, there was levels of sensitivity in which we had to take some stuff off of the public base camp. When we're talking about each other's work, we have to be very sensitive about that, especially in a committee. Um, and this happens on grant panels and things like that. There is a level of sensitivity and privacy that we have to respect. Um, so while we're being very transparent, um, we also needed to protect certain people's um, safe space to talk openly about the work. So again, we were balancing online, offline, in-person, digital, and that's how we made those selections. Okay. Well, Abigail, uh, talk about the current movements. Yeah. So one thing we did, we, we, we did mention was that at the convening, four things kind of came out as the tenets of the Latino Theater Commons. Um, art making, uh, convening and networking, scholarship, and advocacy. Those are the four things that we, that we are always promoting and embodying. And so everything that we, kind of take on as a larger steering committee or as a smaller committee, 
has to has to follow one of those lines, right? We have to be always supporting that stuff. So a couple of things that we're, we're working on. One is the Encuentro, which is happening at LATC in the fall. Um, and, and the important thing to also kind of articulate is that we, because we're still kind of figuring out what we are, like we're, we're always having these identity conversations <laughs> as an organization, um, we have to define like what is our role, like what is the LTC's role in the Encuentro? This is LATC's project, right? This is, this is their idea. What is our, our role in supporting it? It's the Tertulia events, it's providing um, help with the selection committee, it's things like that. Um, we're also doing a hard launch of Café Onda, so we've been, we've been kind of generating um, materials the past year, right? Mm -hmm. or so. But it's a hard launch that's happening in October. We've hired a managing editor. Um, that was a very recent thing that just happened. We, are, um, we have an exploratory, so our next kind of project um, is that we have an exploratory meeting in New York City in August, which uh, Jacob Ferdinand came to the committee and said, hey, I have this idea. I have this idea for this thing I want to call the Soul Project. This is my idea. I don't know what it is, but this is my idea. And so as an organization, we, we were saying, okay, well, we're not going to produce these plays right now. We're, but what we are going to do is is commit to your idea in as far as um, organizing a meeting, and organizing a, a group of artists in New York City who are familiar with Latino theater in New York City, because I can't talk to that, like I don't live in New York City, right? Um, but we can get those people together, we can, we can invite them, we can get the space, we can get the food, we can get the coffee, and we can, we can put them in the room together so they can talk, and we can figure out what the next step of this, of this thing is, so, so that's happening in August. Um, and then the Carnival of New Work, which is happening at DePaul next July, um, date pending, coming out soon. Um, and this is a, a project that we're hoping, depending on you know how it goes, that it becomes an annual event. Biannual. A biannual, excuse me. <laughs> biannual. Um, <laughs> twice, twice biannual. Twice, twice, <laughs> <laughs> every six months. Um, and, and that's again it, because of the nature of I think the, the beautiful part about this organization is that it's it's like growing the flower is that we're, we still have a little bit of freedom and that we can um, we can make our own rules. We can kind of figure we, as we get bigger and as we are responding to the needs of our artists, because that's ultimately what we are, right? We're only as good as the artists who are working for and working with, um, and, and supporting their vision, and supporting them in any way we can. So that's kind of the, the, the layout. I mean, but things are constantly changing, we're, and right now we're developing, I mean, we're already in the process of figuring out 3.0, and, and what are the kind of practices of how we're gonna, how we're gonna formulate that, because again, preventing burnout. There's gonna be people who, this particular 2.0 was really intense, and that's, they need to take a break, and that's okay. That we don't need to, that's fine. Um, finding the new people, I, if one of the beautiful things about doing the quarterly update is that I'm getting responses from people who were forwarded the email from so-and-so, from so-and-so, from so-and-so, and they respond to me and say, how do I get involved? How do I, you know, I live in XYZ city that doesn't have Latino theater, how do I get involved? And this is the perfect way to do it. Again, leveling the playing field, right? Making it as accessible as possible. I have All right. Yes, please. Um, so, so I know this is like this is a, a, a big question that I mean, I'm sure you've discussed on some level. But uh, once the Carnaval is over, then what? Well, that's the so, that's the thing, yeah. right? Is that like so the Soul Project? I mean, when did Jacob submit? Like he that sent that email. Ago. Ago. But we actually have a we actually have a group of people. It's the it's the what are they? Think the, tank. Think tank. tank. We actually have on the steering committee think tank members whose job it is to think of the next initiatives. Oh, great. So we're ongoing. Each committee is is, paying, is, is leapfrogging forward. Right. I think yeah. we've got to get to closings, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, and actually, that's a perfect way to bridge into, into, into it because I think one of the key things to note about the way that the LTC functions that I think is both what makes it so unique and also, you know, what is a challenge to the sort of hyper-scheduled, over-programmed world that we live in is that it's really about what does the community want to do and what is their energy for and who wants to be a champion of X or Y project, you know? And so we very purposefully, I mean, we, we've been saying the LTC as an organization, it's not an organization. It's a community of volunteers who all have full-time jobs, who are working in the theater, who are, some of them are doing multiple jobs, who are actually coming together out of passion to do this work, right? It's not, Abigail is the only staff member, right? I mean, it's not, and this is sort of, I think what we've been trying to say is also the power of the organizing principles behind a commons, right? It's, it's the effective use of energy. And so for me, working for HowlRound, in closing, I just want to say that um, the LTC has been just an incredibly fulfilling experience for me to be able to work on as someone who's been trying to get these sort of ideas into practice and into the larger national community um, over the past couple of years. And I think 
it's been the most concrete manifestation so far of putting a commons-based approach, which is behind everything that HowlRound does, into practice. And it's been the true offer, sort of oper <laughs> operational manifestation, manifestation force of these ideas that anyone, you know, who's not going to get behind, like, access and it was transparency, a right? But it's actually, you want to see how you can do it? Here, here's a model. And it's our hope that the LTC will, in future years, I hope, be a prototype for community organizing in the arts, I mean anywhere, for any community who wants to come together, who has an energy and a passion to make change in whatever way they see fit. So, you know. So in the affinity group could take this on. Anybody, yeah, absolutely. We were hoping we'd get other this affinity is, groups here. This is the point of this, of us sharing it through technology, you know, this panel is about how can this stuff that we've gone through the last two years, and even this experiment in trying to connect Skype, how can this be used by others? Just and I think there yes. is a movement, the Asian American Theater and Asian Pacific Island, they have started a movement, they're trying to do their first convening. There's there's similar models that are burgeoning and yeah. also the National what? Black Theater at the back. Yeah, there's so it's it's what's really important is that I think in addition to many things is that this te technology and what the LTC Commons has discovered is, and it's why I, I get this impatient, is you don't need an institution, right? You don't need an institution, we don't need a building. We don't need, um, and, and we have many institutions amongst us, we have many resources amongst us, we don't need one institution to give us permission or give us space or give us money to do anything. We don't, have a, we don't need a building, we don't need an artistic director, we don't need a, you know, we do need a producer. <laughs> but we don't, you know, this allows us maximum flexibility to pool our resources and make whatever we want to happen, happen. So whenever, when people are kind of like, oh my God, I got burnout or bitterness, I say, listen, everybody, no vamos. The bus is at the station, we're all going. You know what I mean? You can just go. If you can pull your resources um, and use the tools that allow you to connect to one another, you can just make stuff happen, which is what we're doing and what we hope many, many other affinity groups will, will uh, take on. And then we can all hopefully do together, have lots of babies. I just say that, you know, kind of piggyback on everything and, and the idea too of like, yes, there's a producer, but it was always very clear when I, when I was hired that this is a two year thing and then somebody else does it because there needs to be new blood. That's the, that's how this will continue to grow, right? Is that there's always constantly new people coming in and providing their, their two cents. So, I mean, that's, I think the, the, one of the most beautiful parts of this is that it's not going to be personality driven because it's ultimately all about the comments. So. Um, and I would like to close out. Thank you so much, everybody. Just going to wrap it up, and, and we have space for comments, I'm sure. I want to thank Lalok. I'm going to wave at him because he texted and said, he's I'm watching. watching on TV. No. <laughs> so he's, even though we couldn't make the Skype work completely, um, he was able to participate and be with us through HowlRound TV. I want to thank HowlRound, Jamie, everything that they've done, everything that we've all done to make this thing happen and move forward, because many of us here in this room have been part of making this thing happen from the beginning. Um, and I, I hope you'll take this information and share it in some way or use it. Come back to us if you need more information from us. Contact Abigail. Um, or find us through, you know, find any of us. I'm sure we're happy to share whatever we, whatever tools we have at our disposal with you and your efforts. Um, we're more than happy about that. And I think ultimately it is about people talking to each other and, and, and raising our profile. So with that, any final questions or comments? Can I say Can I just say that I feel like maybe one of the things I learned today was that even with all technology and uh, what I feel like is happening here is that you do need vision. Yeah. And I like I love what you said, Jamie. I think it, it needs to the vision can come from the community. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not an artistic director, but you do need vision. And I think what we've witnessed today in a way is that vision comes from a lot of different places and that there's still an aesthetic, there's still a form, mm -hmm. there's still art to be made, there's still elevation of the art, but that it, that doesn't necessarily have to come like this. Mm -hmm. And when it comes like this, this. Yeah. Yeah. that's right, yeah, yeah. 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 Just really, the chief, I guess, because you just reminded me, I wrote this down, um, in the radical outreach um, conversation that I was at just before this, um, something that was brought to the room was that communities themselves can be the best protagonist of their concerns. Yeah. And that's true. That's exactly what this is. It's a way to get those that shared vision articulated, honed in, like like writing a mission statement together. Have you ever done that? It's like, oh, 
but you do it together so we have all the buy-in. And even this, this document that I've been passing around, this one sheet, this was a bunch of us wrote it. Yeah. You know what I mean? A bunch of us wrote this and I just basically edited it mm -hmm. all together, but it was all through Basecamp. Some of this is Juliet, some of this is Kinan, some of this is Olga, some of this is me, some of this is Karen, you know, but that's, that's what you're saying, is this is, we are our own artistic director. Yeah. We are our artistic director. And it is, and I'll say, but I'll go back and say it, the movement that Chantal started talking about, which then hiccuped for a while and, and um, uh, uh, dissipated, got picked up again because we could network again through tools that developed about five years ago, actually. So it's Just incredible. think what we can do in 10. That's right. Woohoo! Okay. Lalok, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for thank coming. You thank, you. thank you. Thank you, TCG. You have one? Is the same one. Same one. Anybody?